Well, uh, good morning or good afternoon or good evening to you, wherever you may be. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, special seminar of the Hoover Institution's uh, project on China's global sharp power. Uh, my name is Larry Diamond. I'm a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. Uh, it's my honor and continuing pleasure to lead this program uh, in coordination with my co-leader, Glenn Tifford, who uh, coincidentally is one of our speakers today. Today, we're going to be taking a deep uh, dive of uh, introduction and discussion of a new research paper that our um, project uh, has solicited and is publishing, uh, written by uh, two of our speakers, Jeff Stoff and uh, uh, Glenn Tifford. Uh, the topic of the paper is the topic of our program today, Eyes Wide Open, Ethical Risks in Research Collaboration with China. And I will say it follows upon the publication uh, of uh, about a year ago of this very important report, which uh, Glenn and Jeff co-authored with Kevin Gamash at Texas A&M. Uh, entitled Global Engagement, Reth Rethinking Risk in the Research Enterprise. And you can find this report on the website uh, of our project. Uh, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, our speakers uh, in the order that they're going to speak. Um, uh, Jeff and Glenn are going to provide an overview of this paper about um, the role of the Chinese Academy of Sciences Institute of Automation uh, in uh, collaborating uh, with US and other international universities and technology firms on the one hand, and on the other hand, providing the cutting edge technological uh, infrastructure for um, the most uh, comprehensive mass surveillance state in the history of human society. Uh, a state which has been uh, relentlessly abusing human rights uh, and now beginning to deploy this technology, particularly systematically uh, in Xinjiang for that prom uh, process. So to begin, uh, Jeff Stoff, Jeffrey Stoff is the founder of Redcliffe Enterprises, a startup that seeks to build public-private partnerships to protect research and intellectual capital. Stoff spent 18 years in the US government as a senior analyst focused on critical technology protection issues. He has advised the White House, the departments of both defense and state and the office of the director of national intelligence. Uh, his co-author of this report, Glenn Tiffert, is a research fellow at the Hoover Institution, a historian of modern China, and as I said, co-leader with me of the Hoover Project on China's global sharp power. Uh, he works closely with government and civil society partners to document and build resilience against authoritarian interference with democratic institutions. And I've already mentioned to you uh, his co-authored and edited book, Global Engagement, Rethinking Risk in the Research Enterprise. We're extremely uh, grateful and pleased that our frequent uh, collaborator and uh, an inspiration for a lot of the work we do, the China Director at Human Rights Watch, Sophie Richardson uh, is here to act as commentator and uh, amplifier, uh, and we'll see if critic uh, of some elements of the report. She has overseen uh, the research and advocacy on China of Human Rights Watch, one of the most important uh, human rights organizations in the world since 2006, and has published extensively on human rights and political reform uh, in China and across Southeast Asia. She's, she's the author of China, Cambodia, and the Five Principles of Peaceful Coexistence. So that's our program. And um, Jeff, I think uh, we're going to begin with you. Actually, Larry, I'm going to start okay. us off. And I want All to right. thank you for that 
fabulous introduction. Um, to give you all a bit of a roadmap, I'll be providing the big picture context in which we're situating this report, and Jeff will review our findings in detail. And then we'll sort of tag team on our recommendations before Sophie joins us in conversation. But before plunging into the report, I'd like to take the opportunity to announce an initiative devoted to research security and integrity here at our project on China's global sharp power. Those of you familiar with us will know that this really formalizes a stream of research that has been a pillar of our project since even before Lord Chris Patton, Chancellor of the University of Oxford in the UK, keynoted our project's launch, I want to say, almost two years ago. Today's report, as Larry suggested, is in fact the third in a series of major reports we've published on research security and integrity. The first in 2018 catalyzed a national discussion about improper foreign influence in US institutions, uh, including academia and think tanks. And please bring up the slide. The second in 2020 documented the national security risks posed by uh, weekly supervised collaboration between US universities and national labs on the one hand, and a subset of PRC universities that are closely tied to China's defense industrial base and are specifically tasked with advancing China's military modernization. That was in 2020. Today, we expand on that body of work with a case study that shows that our research enterprise could be doing a far better job of living up to the values that it professes to hold dear with regard to research ethics, social responsibility, and human rights when it collaborates with partners in authoritarian nations such as China. By the way, you can download all of these reports, as Larry said, and much more for free from our website, www.hoover.org cgsp. Today's report is a case study about how the existing paradigms through which we regulate and talk about international research collaboration are no longer fit for purpose, particularly when it comes to partners in authoritarian nations. So let me start with a little background on that. In the US, we have a highly permissive regulatory regime governing research. Since 1985, as a matter of national policy, we generally do not restrict federally funded fundamental research that is published and shared broadly. That policy suits a free society and has served us well over the years, and it's now baked into our culture of how we do science. Make no mistake that when you hear scientists or university administrators say that their work is openly published, they are making a political claim that the government has no authority to restrict it. And indeed, this open and fundamental research exception works like a sort of free pass out of many of the export controls and other regulations that would otherwise govern their work. Unfortunately, while universities are saying to government, hands off, they are not stepping in to take adequate responsibility for what they do themselves. And malign actors exploit and thrive in that immense but really lightly policed environment. That science is open and global and apolitical is a fine and noble idea, but it's also an ideological statement, a declaration of how the world ought to be rather than how it is. It's furthermore the contingent product of a particular historical moment, the post-Cold War era of, of American hyperpower, in which the end of history seemed to be upon us, democracy was ascendant, and Americans enjoyed the luxury of not thinking very hard about their assumptions because there were no credible global competitors. That era is over, and policies premised on it ought to be re-examined. Look around. Our information spaces are filled with malign actors exploiting, polluting, perverting, or corrupting weakly governed open systems in a sort of tragedy of the commons. Social media is a metonym for this new reality. The openness that we preach only works when it is premised on compatible goals and values, shared accountability, trust, and reciprocity. Those prerequisites are not universal. They exist among some actors, but not others. And those in authoritarian nations like China tend to fall into the latter category. Why? Because irrespective of their individual rectitude, which may be of the highest order in individual cases, they must answer to authorities that stand for political principles inimical to our own. It's only in liberal democracies with healthy and vibrant civil societies that we can indulge the conceit that science is not political. Much of the rest of the world marches to a different tune, and under Xi Jinping, China is at the forefront of that parade. 
Ignoring this is to be willfully blind or recklessly complicit in our own demise. Next slide, please. Invoking the idea that science is open and global as catechism has become a way of avoiding a series of a, a reckoning with a series of uncomfortable questions and an uncomfortable reality and the choices they require. Our last report, which focused primarily on national security, had three principal findings that apply equally well today. First, collaboration in the areas of research security and integrity is too often, or I'm sorry, compliance in the areas of research security and integrity is too often a mechanical exercise of ticking boxes, filing forms, and running names against databases of restricted entities or technologies, which is fine to a point. But in addition to asking whether a prospective collaboration is legal in a formal sense, our research enterprise should be asking and confirming that it comports with national interests, research ethics, and our democratic values. That's just simply good citizenship. Our research enterprise is not in the habit of asking those more subjective questions very deeply or systematically because no one is compelling it to, and it's therefore passing risk on to others. It must do better if it, is, if it is to responsibly use the wide margin of institutional autonomy and academic freedom that it enjoys. And no one wants government to step in to micromanage this space. Second, the challenge is vexing because a broader array of technologies are dual use than ever before, or they simply defy traditional export controls. The facial or iris recognition technology that we're going to talk about today and that unlocks our phones or speeds us through airport security is being used by authoritarian governments to target dissenters and track truth-seeking journalists. How do you put export controls on the applied mathematics and behind cutting edge algorithms or best in class machine learning models? Which is to say that in many cases, the science is less the problem than the parties who wield it, the end uses to which it is put, and the systemic checks and balances that ensure public accountability. The old sops of building high fences around small yards of sensitive technologies or using export controls like a magic wand are wholly inadequate to this nuanced environment in which context is everything. Thus, after the binary determination of whether a given activity is legal or illegal, there must be a second process that involves making judgment calls about the kind of company we want to keep. Other industries do this all the time, and to do it well, they must know their customers and conduct the individuated due diligence necessary to assess, price, and mitigate risk. How can you ethically partner with entities and authoritarian nations if you do anything less? Third, it is right and proper that we are critically interrogating the ramifications of biometric, genomic, and artificial intelligence technologies within our own societies. The argument that science and these technologies are socially or politically neutral no longer satisfies when we can see how it can polarize discourse and aggravate inequities of race, gender, wealth, and power. Yet we do not turn that lens outward. It's simply perverse that we scrutinize participation in the development and application of these technologies at home more carefully than we do in the authoritarian nations that we partner with. In spite of lots of talk from universities about how administrators consider risks related to national security, economic competitiveness, and civil and human rights, our report shows that there is a lot of work to be done in this space. We need to assess new categories of risk in more probing ways. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff now to walk you through why the status quo needs to change. Jeff, over to you. Thanks. Thank you, Glenn. And uh, thanks to Larry and the Hoover Institution for their uh, support on this project. Um, so what I'm going to do is go over some of the uh, key elements of the report um, that we that's now posted on Hoover's website. I encourage you all to take a a close look. Um, there's a lot of material in there. There's a number of appendices as well um, with a lot of data and entities and prop, uh, programs of, of concern. Um, and this, this study is really a follow-on to the previous study um, on why, uh, how and why robust due, due, due diligence is really needed uh, when, when it comes to do, uh, partnering with PRC research institutions. Can you go to the next slide, please? So, 
Um, what we did is we conducted robust due diligence on this particular institute, the Chinese Academy of Sciences Institute of Automation, um, or CASIA for short. Um, we examined its structure, its research programs, collaboration, partners, affiliated business entities, um, and a survey of scientific and engineering literature uh, published between 2014 and 2020 or beneficial research in neuroscience and other AI related fields. Um, but it's also at the same time, uh, it, it, it's also uh, deeply involved in mass surveillance related research um, and AI applications that enable that and uh, partners extensively with public security apparatus um, in China. It would also be remiss not to mention that um, Cassia also partners extensively with the uh, defense, Ch China's defense research and industrial base. And uh, we have an appendix uh, in the back that kind of uh, surveys that. Uh, the, the main point of this paper was really to look at the ethical implications of surveillance, but um, they are also deeply involved partnering with all seven of the seven sons of national defense universities that we profiled in our previous paper. Um, the People's Liberation Army, as uh, major state-owned defense conglomerates and a division of China's nuclear weapons complex. Um, but our focus is on the surveillance uh, R&D. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, so as you can see, uh, Kessia is, is really deeply involved in a number of areas. And on the left, these are uh, uh, potentially benign or beneficial areas. Um, quite a lot of medical and neuroscience and uh, AI and brain mapping type uh, uh, research, but they're also utilizing this type of research for surveillance applications that you can see on the right. <clears throat> and in fact, um, one of the, the major subdivisions of CASIA is this major uh, national laboratory, a state key lab, designated state key laboratory, called the National Laboratory of Pattern Recognition. And they appear to be the epicenter of this mass surveillance um, AI and machine learning research on these topics you see on the right. Now I'm gonna take a few minutes here and kind of go walk through some of our salient elements. You could uh, bring the slides down for a few moments. And um, so what we found is we took, we, we focused a lot on this National Laboratory on Pattern Recognition, that NLP or NLPR for short, and they collaborate quite extensively with um, international academic institutions from Five Eyes, European countries uh, and Japan. And, the, uh, and both with academic institutions and the private and private companies as well. Um, and again, they seem to they seem to be, have a, a very important role in this mass surveillance technology R and D. And they partner with other CASIA divisions, um, where there are interdisciplinary sort of subjects in hardware and software applications to this for public security and, and defense applications. When we looked at the corpus of domestic literature, we looked at some of the research output that Cassia was doing, and we find that they have uh, quite a few partnerships um, and funding from uh, China's Ministry of Public Security and its subordinate organs, the People's Armed Police, um, and, and related entities. And we, we examined some of the research outputs they did, and for example, they're publishing on head-shoulder detection and multi-target tracking and video surveillance kind of technology. And so we surveyed some of that in the report to show what they're doing. Um, another interesting aspect is one of the key leaders of CASIA is a man named Dr. Tan Tianyu. And he's the head of this national uh, subdivision of this national laboratory. Um, he was actually trained in the UK and recruited through one of China's state-sponsored talent recruitment programs, the 100 Talents Program, under the Chinese Academy of Sciences. And for the last couple of decades, he's played a leadership role in a variety of capacities at CASIA and has been instrumental in fostering international collaboration between international um, research institutions and companies and CASIA. Um, he is an expert himself in computer vision, AI, machine learning, and with applications in uh, video and mass surveillance and biometrics. Um, he's also held in other, uh, other positions. Interestingly, he is a vice chairman of the Western Return Scholars Association, which is a subdivision of the United Front Work Department of the Communist Party, which is involved in global influence operations. Um, also interestingly, 
none of his CVs, resumes, bios, even in Chinese, um, reveal that he is a shareholder, chairman, inventor, or chief scientist of at least four commercial spinoffs or companies affiliated with Cassia that directly supply surveillance technologies to public security organs in China. And um, in 2016, uh, about, about four years ago, he was named the deputy director of the Chinese government central liaison office in Hong Kong. Um, and so we find it quite disturbing that a, a renowned expert in computer vision and, and surveillance technologies that he's commercializing um, becomes one of the Chinese government's leaders in Hong Kong um, amidst you know, a wave of crackdown. And at the beginning of this year, the, U the US Treasury Department, in fact, uh, placed Dr. Tan on the specially designated national list of sanctioned individuals for helping to preside over the human rights abuses that are occurring in Hong Kong. And yet this individual has, uh, is, is widely recognized um, internationally and collaborates with a number of, of institutions, uh, both in the public and private sectors. Um, we also, in the, in the paper, we, we examined some of the international collaboration that Cassia has, particularly with the United States. And we looked at both um, an international corpus of English literature as well as Chinese literature. And within the international corpus, we found 744 uh, publications that had Cassia affiliated co-authors and, and authors co-authors from U.S. institutions, 224 U.S. research institutions we identified, and 10 U.S. technology companies that were collaborating. Now, within this corpus, this is what represents the challenge and the dual identity that Cassia has. Approximately 40% of the corpus involved medical or neuroscience fields that, that, that seemed beneficial or benign. And in fact, credit of the US National Institutes of Health as a funding source. And we presume that the NIH funding was actually going to the US based co authors. We have no evidence that they were funding CASIA. Um, but never, and nevertheless, the, the research itself is again brain science and neuroscience and, and, and uh, presumably beneficial or benign. The problem is the CASIA based co authors within that corpus um, are also partnering or part of that national laboratory pattern recognition. Um, and we even provide an example of an article where one of Cassia's brain science centers that are doing a lot of this research is also involved in surveillance research. So there's a serious and documented risk of them diverting some of this uh, benign research for um, uh, harmful or uh, unethical applications. Can you pull up the slide on this deck, please? So I'm going to provide one, one final example. Um, Cassia itself is an ecosystem where it has, it has invested in it over thir almost 40 uh, enterprises and has five, at least five commercial spin-offs. Um, and so the research that Cassia is doing is not simply theoretical. Um, they are actually uh, created companies that have products and services that partner with public security and defense apparatus in China. And this is one of the examples we have in our paper, one of the more egregious examples, and this is Vistec. And Vistec is involved in uh, video surveillance technologies. Incidentally, the chief inventor is Dr. Tan Tianyu, who just mentioned, and they provide facial recognition and video surveillance technologies, including for quote unquote, anti-terrorism efforts in Xinjiang, which I'm sure our colleague Sophie can explain in a lot more detail. Um, also interestingly about this, this company, while we were conducting research on it, its website went down. It was removed and is no longer accessible from US points of presence. And even when it was accessible, all of the material on this website were just screenshots or images. There was no um, retrievable text, couldn't be indexed by search engines. So um, it represents some concern. And you can see on the right, um, just a handful of some of the partners it, it, it claims to have, um, including this joint institute that Cassia has done um, with um, uh, Intel Corporation. And then the other ones down on the bottom there, Hikvision is a, a major surveillance technology company that's on the Commerce Department of Commerce Entity list. 
as well as of two major defense conglomerates you can see at the bottom, CETC and the division of an aerospace, defense aerospace conglomerate. In summary, what, what we found was just a sampling and we wanna, we wanna make clear a couple things. First is this was not an exhaustive survey of all the divisions, programs, partnerships that Cassie is involved in. And we also did not do a, a technical survey of all of the research to determine how much of it has potential or direct surveillance applications. We really just picked the ones that were of obviously uh, related to that. And so we are likely understating the extent of Kessie's involvement in, in surveillance related research. Um, and so they continue to warrant scrutiny. Uh, the other thing that's important to note is that Kessia partners with a number of domestic institutions, and we believe that Kessia is not the only entity involved in ethically troubling research in China. And this is just one of them. And so far more efforts need to be uh, done to kind of peel this back and really understand the scale and scope of this activity. If you go to the next slide, I'm gonna turn it over to Glenn. Uh, and he and I are gonna talk about, you know, given these challenges that we have um, and the collaboration that Cassia enjoys and what they're doing, what should we, what should we be doing about it? I'll turn over to Glenn, thanks. Thanks, Jeff. As Jeff was suggesting, it's Cassia's dual identity that is really the challenge here. On the one hand, they present a face to the outside world that, that suggests that you know, they're deeply engaged in problems of common concern with regard to brain science, neuroscience, curing disease. And so international partners, because Cassia is, is, a, is a global hub for research in this activity and has cutting edge talent and is extremely well resourced, international partners would want to work with them in these areas and can then turn around and say, our collaboration with this entity is, is, is purely for upstanding purposes in medical science and, and benign applications. However, the challenging thing about institutions like CASIA, which are found throughout authoritarian nations, is that they have this darker side in which they apply this basic fundamental research and particularly the research and technologies that they acquire abroad through those channels to more reprehensible applications in public security, surveillance, and defense. And so our first recommendation really is that for CASIA and the subordinate divisions, labs, and commercial spinoffs um, that we identify in the report to put that on the, on the Commerce Department's entity list so that private firms will terminate their relationships with CASIA and those businesses. Now that does not solve the problem of academic collaboration uh, with CASIA, because again, as I suggested, the fact that an, an entity is on the commerce's entity list uh, is, uh, is, is not uh, dispositive when you're talking about fundamental and open research. Um, again, under US national policy, fundamental open published research gets a free pass out of those export control regimes. Uh, so consequently, research institutions in the US and other democracies must audit their formal and informal collaboration and partnerships with CASIA in-house for ethical and research integrity risks. And clearly though they say they are doing this type of audit and maintaining this kind of oversight over their activity, the fact that we were able to find 224 US institutions collaborating with CASIA over the course of 2016 through 2020 um, in areas that had direct applications to China's surveillance state indicates that the level of scrutiny this activity is getting is far below where it needs to be. The third recommendation is that ethical review processes such as institutional review boards need updated standards and conditions to address things like data governance, privacy protections, and surveillance applications, even when research does not directly involve human subjects. At the moment, many of the areas of research touching on artificial intelligence and machine learning on iris recognition, gait recognition, facial recognition, because they do not involve individuated human subjects are not subject to the existing regime of institutional review boards. Uh, very often the argument is made that the data can be anonymized or not connected to particular individuals, though increasingly we find that technologies are in fact able to strip out and de-anonymize the data and connect it to individuals. So this is how that research is able to move forward without the kind of ethical review 
process that, that, that would be triggered if there were direct human subjects research. We argue that we need to expand the realm of ethical review to include this type of research, particularly when you're partnering with an entity in an authoritarian nation. Now, the challenge here is that universities are not well resourced and lack the capacity to make the finely articulated and judgment calls about who to partner with, which individuals are clean to work with, which institutions are better or worse to work with, which nations are better to work with, what legal regimes govern, for, ex for example, the, uh, the use of data in those countries. Um, this is a heavy lift for a lot of institutions which are unequally resourced. And so in order to do this well, we recommend recommendation number four, which I'll pass over back to Jeff. Thanks, Glenn. So recognizing, as Glenn mentioned, that, that this is a significant challenge, the, the type of due diligence that we did for this report was, was uh, admittedly quite labor intensive. Um, uh, it, it took a, a fair amount of work. And so what really needs to happen is we need to build a, a coalition of partners among civil society institutions that um, the government can sponsor in some capacity. Um, but we really propose this sort of coalition or an independent entity that involves institutions like think tanks. I'll step in uh, until Jeff comes back. Um, we're proposing a coalition of, of independent. Other... Oh, there you go, Jeff. You, you dropped out for a moment. Uh, my, my apologies. I think I'm back. Um, so uh, what we're trying to do is we argue that this can, because this cannot be done by individual uh, institution, uh, academic institutions, they're not really equipped for that. Um, and, and to be frank, uh, based on my experience, it's my personal opinion. The, the, the government is also not really well equipped to do this. It's not really their, their mission to do this. Um, but so we think a hybrid independent trusted entity that can, that can combine the unique capabilities of the private sector and think tanks and NGOs um, can really get at this problem. And if we work together at this, this is not, this is not an, uh, this is a, a, a solvable task. And then it will allow a much, a lot more rigorous oversight um, over our research partners that require such uh, rigor from authoritarian nations like China. Thanks, Jeff. So now we want to open it uh, up for discussion with Sophie and invite her to reflect on our report and offer her own thoughts. Larry, Glenn, Jeff, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me to join you. Um, as Glenn may recall, when, I, when he first sent me a copy of this report, I think I read the first three pages and sent him an email that just said, whoa, in the subject line. Um, I, I think it's a brilliant piece of work that really flags up the chasm. It's not just a blip, folks. It's a chasm between the kind of uh, uh, you know, due diligence and self-scrutiny that universities, governments, and companies say they do. <laughs> and derogatory information that is out there to be found uh, if one goes looking for it. And you know, we can have a long conversation about why that gap exists, why, for example, uh, you know, compliance offices in large corporations or at universities uh, aren't aware of or don't go looking for this kind of information. Uh, but I think the, the, the call for a very different approach to due diligence is a key message of this report. And I think we all have quite a bit of work to do uh, in this realm. If, if you'll indulge me for just a moment, I think we're Human Rights Watch is part of this conversation precisely because we published in March of 2019 uh, a code of conduct to help specifically universities uh, push back against or insulate themselves from Chinese government pressure in countries like the United States. The report looked primarily drew on cases from Australia, the UK, Canada. Uh, and among the recommendations that we made in that, in that code uh, were that universities needed to be much more rigorous in assessing and monitoring 
uh, the Chinese government linked organizations they were dealing with and that they should be disclosing Chinese government or government linked money. And it is for precisely the reasons that, that, that Jeff and Glenn are laying out that there are connections, that there can be connections to these very problematic individuals or institutions. Uh, that's it's just it is the gap uh, that I think still has to be filled and it has real consequences, not just I think in terms of reputational risk. But for academic freedom more broadly, uh, I certainly hope that that the universities that are listening to this conversation take this piece of a complicated puzzle as seriously as they do considerations about uh national security issues for example um this is you know this is a, this is a complicated problem but there's a set of recommendations here uh to work with there are a number of echoes uh in this report to work that we have done uh you know the chinese government now deploys a surveillance state unlike one known in modern history uh with many different players but certainly at its core are the state security apparatus uh and you know these are the agencies that generate our daily caseload uh, but the way that outside actors do and don't approach those entities is often either I think willfully poorly informed or hopeful that somehow there are reformists off there in the machine someplace who will do the right thing with technology when instead you know, the kinds of things that we document are, are you know, similar to the issues in this report about you know, predictive policing, for example, or uh, uh, you know, the pedestrian attitude database. Uh, was already familiar to us. And this takes place in a context where there are virtually no privacy rights uh, and where the ability to give consent in research uh, is a rarity, I will say. I think we are pleased to see, for example, that Springer Nature has just had to retract uh, a number of papers published because it could not show that the research in question had been done with adequate informed consent. And this particularly was about uh, certain communities inside China, uh, Uyghurs, Tibetans. Uh, you know, it's another way in which the standards are just, I think, abandoned without even really being uh, uh, deployed in the face of serious systemic uncorrected human rights violations. Um, my last observation uh, it, it will lead to will lead to a question, I promise, and has embedded in it, I think, what is is my sole tiny little complaint about the report, uh, but also really, in a way, flags up, I think, the toughest question for all of us who you know, want and need to have positive, uh, beneficial uh, uh, collaboration with actors inside the mainland at a time, especially when their ability to conduct research in, in an ethical manner uh, is highly, highly limited. And my, my complaint is the, is the phrase in the title, with China, as opposed to with Chinese government agencies or Chinese government officials uh, uh, to sort of narrow the frame a little bit. But I think one of the greatest conundrums is figuring out how to do that research ethically at a time when the constraints on the other end are enormous. Is the answer for universities to make more room on their home campuses for people? Uh, you know, is it for companies who are engaging in certain kinds of research to you know, let their Chinese counterparts have the opportunity to be outside the country and do research in a more ethics respecting environment? Uh, there are a lot of different ways to play that out, but I think we don't want to make the mistake that, for example, the DOJ has made to simply conflate an entire country or, or people of a particular uh, citizenship uh, with an authoritarian regime. But maybe if I can start with what, what I hope is a fairly straightforward question, uh, I'm curious to know, Jeff and Glenn, you know, why Tan Tianyo and, and Kasia. Why, why, why him? Why them? 
how did this first come across your radar and how did you start sort of unpeeling the onion, so to speak? I'll take a stab at that. So um, it actually was based on some previous work done while I was in the government where we were looking at uh, major institutions in China um, that conduct um, or develop computer vision applications as a subdiscipline to AI for, for obvious national security and economic security reasons. And so that came up on our radar as um, um, we had a little bit of information on Cassia that seemed to, to play a, a pretty important role in uh, computer vision research. And then, so I went ahead and, and did extensive. Let me address your, your point about with China, um, because I think it's a, it's a well-made point. And, and I actually share your concerns. Um, the challenge for us was in the context of coming up with a subtitle. Um, conveying all of the different layers um, that are involved in, in, in the due diligence uh, that we're asking for. Because in some cases, the problem is with an individual like Dr. Tan, for example, right? In other cases, the, the problem, you, you might have full faith in the rectitude of the individual you're working with, but they might be embedded in the subunit uh, of an institution or, or, an ins or an institution that's problematic, right? And then there's, you know, back out one layer further, and you're talking about a larger political ecosystem, right? So there are multiple layers of concern here, all of which need to be disaggregated and taken seriously. It's not enough just to say that the individual that I collaborate with, I know personally very well, and they have the highest standards of, of ethics and, and morality. If they're embedded in a system that compels them to apply their work uh, or, or takes their work and diverts it to purposes that we find reprehensible, um, then, then we need to know about that, right? So there are layers here and the easiest way to capture that in the context of a subtitle was with China. But I recognize that, that it, it is subject to multiple readings. And I wanna make the point that, you know, our goal here is not to shut down collaboration with China by any means, right? It's to appreciate the risks that are involved to be able to assess them accurately so we can take appropriate mitigation so that we can be sure that we're making things better rather than making them worse. You know, uh, what we saw in the cases that we, that in, in, in the documented research that we examined closely is lots of examples of US collaborators apparently taking an interesting problem in AI research or facial recognition, right? Something that in their context is, you know, a question that's worth answering, right? But in a Chinese context, in an authoritarian context, the application of the answer is truly frightening. So when you're trying to build a better facial recognition algorithm or you're doing object tracking or you're developing an AI model that will automatically tag video from you know, large camera networks with 72 different attributes and automatically follow people across town. This is something we need to be thinking about hard, right? And that's not really happening if you're, question, if you're approaching this transactionally saying, I have a particular algorithm that I wanna refine or a particular problem in AI that I wanna pursue. Right? It's those kinds of questions that need to be asked. So let me turn it back over to Jeff, who, who, who got interrupted with a technical glitch um, to complete his answer. Yeah, no, um, actually, that we can move on. I think Glenn sufficiently answered that one. Sure. Well, then maybe I'll just put one other question to you before passing back to, um, to Larry. And it's really, I'm curious to know, why do you think these connections got missed? You know, how, how is it that an OFAC sanctions database, you know, corporate compliance offices, uh, you know, university review boards, where along the way did these things go haywire? So uh, there's, there's, there's a multi-layered aspect to that. Um, you know, first is there is obfuscation that's occurring um, where, where China is not, and these institutions are not revealing the kind of partnerships and projects they're doing. Um, and yes, you could, you could uh, sometimes simple searching within the vernacular will answer that, but sometimes not. Um, sometimes it takes a lot of uh, real digging into the kind of research outputs they're doing and the partners they have. Um, and that requires a lot, lot more effort. And I would argue that it, because of the open nature of research collaboration uh, in the US, it's very possible that US academic institutions are not always aware or tracking 
what their researchers are doing or who they're collaborating with, that you know they're 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 encouraged to to re, you know research problems uh, globally, and so there's not a systematic review of who's partnering with who and in what capacity. And in most of this case that, that we're describing in this report is likely informal. Um, we do highlight some formal partnerships that are, are troubling and, and, and why did uh, certain corporations not do the kind of due diligence before they set up a joint institute is a, is a very good question. Um, they could have checked. Uh, but in an academic context, it, it's hard. And without a regulatory requirement or oversight over it, there's not really an incentive for academia to even check. Um, and, and on the government side, um, again, because if this is not within an export control regime, um, this doesn't fall neatly into any sort of regulatory or counterintelligence sort of oversight. Um, uh, it, and so there's really not a system in place to, to kind of monitor this um, just because of the lack of the regulatory regime. When you think about the way the regulatory regime's been set up in the paradigm, it's it, it describes an older reality that doesn't really capture where we're at right now. You know, we have the traditional realm of Cold War espionage and technologies, you know, missile technology, uh, these days increasingly semiconductors that are fairly good for tangible objects, right? It's like we don't want someone to get this widget, right? Um, Likewise, we have fairly good regulatory rules in place with regard to terrorist financing that are, you know, a product of the last 25 years. What we don't have is this area that, that covers technologies and ideas that are in people's heads, algorithms. Um, we're not, we haven't figured out the right way to regulate that. And so this is why our report focuses on the partners, um, the company we keep knowing who, um, who you're working with and, and the ecosystem that they inhabit so that you have some assurance that while you might be working on something that is ostensibly benign, they're not gonna turn around and hand it to someone else for a, you know, an abhorrent application. I, I, sometime when we have more time, I'll, I'll argue the, uh, the, the tangible objects piece of the puzzle too, because the reality is that it is illegal under US law to export handcuffs uh, to the Chinese security apparatus, it is not illegal to export DNA sequencers, uh, which is now a very commonly used tool in policing. But with that, uh, and only two minutes late, I will hand back to Larry uh, uh, to moderate the Q&A from the audience. Uh, thanks, Sophia. I knew you'd press this in a great direction, and you have. Um, <clears throat> let me just say before I uh, ask uh, the next question that I've become even more deeply sobered <clears throat> in the last two years by the difficulty of the challenge. Um, as I've seen in, in part, yes, some openness to engagement with the federal government on these issues, but a lot of pushback from the academic and scientific communities. And I think at least three things that we're dealing with now are number one, the intrinsic desire uh, of universities for autonomy and understandable desire of universities for research and expressive freedom and autonomy for government control. Uh, and uh, related to that, the sincere conviction on the part of uh, quite a lot of the scientific and engineering community in universities that collaboration across borders is intrinsically a good thing that will push forward the boundaries of knowledge. And unless it's something very specific, like are we transferring the ability to, you know, uh, have their nuclear weapons more precisely target our cities, um, you know, uh, the bias should be for international cooperation and exchange. Second, as Sophie mentioned, I think we're now facing a, a, a reaction uh, against the um, some of the overreach or mistakes of the China Initiative and the Justice Department. And there's a very serious kind of moral backlash against um, well, we should all be concerned about it. We've talked about it in our other programs, which is ethnic profiling, stereotyping, and generalizing to all Chinese. And as Sophie made very, I, I think, 
appropriately uh, a larger point about this. And the third thing is, uh, it just needs to be said, it's the other side of the coin I just put on the table. The deliberate uh, United Front uh, manipulation uh, of this conversation to uh, stimulate uh, a reaction against any pushback or constraint by uh, constantly bound, pounding the table on ethnic profiling and discrimination and suggesting that um, anything that could be done in this regard is anti-China or anti-Chinese. And I think that um, these are evolving and formidable obstacles. So I'd like you to comment on those three obstacles. And then I'd like one of you or both of you to elaborate on your proposal of an, a new kind of civil society coalition. It's an intriguing idea, but I'm wondering if you could put more operational flesh on the bones on how it would work and who would stand it up. So let me start, Larry, by absolutely echoing your grave concern that, that we not take this in the wrong direction and, and feed into what is, I think, a deeply concerning wave of ethnic profiling and, and actual physical violence against individuals in our society and the fact that people's reputations and careers are, are being questioned and ruined without adequate evidence. Um, we, we, we repudiate all of that um, you know, unequivocally. Um, our goal here really is quite serious about human rights. It's about ensuring the human rights of everyone, uh, including the, the people doing this research who, who you know, should not, it, it, very often I think it's that they don't appreciate um, the environment that they're operating in. Uh, one cannot expect an individual uh, scientist, uh, some, say in computer science, for example, or uh, someone who works in the realm of computer vision, to appreciate um, the political system that, that China has and to appreciate all of the ways in which their research might be misapplied um, when they're thinking purely about the science that they do. So there needs to be a process. We can't put it on their shoulders. And currently the way the rules are written and the way the processes exist, it does rest on the shoulders of the individual researcher to understand the larger scope of what they're doing and the ramifications of it and to make the right decisions. And I think that's a mistake because we can't expect them to have competencies across the range of issues I agree. That, that are involved here. And so the institutions need to step up and create formal processes, systematize, that test you know, the assumptions behind this research. Uh, that needs to happen, you know, in, and we suggest institutional review boards are a way of doing that. That's a pre-existing system. So expand their scope to include the kind of research that we're talking about in this report. Um, but beyond that, um, even individual universities are not necessarily going to appreciate the kinds of things that we highlight in this report. So we do need to have an independent entity um, that can fill in those gaps. Government can't do it because government will have classified information streams that it will not want to share with other parties. Universities have no incentive to do it. So we need to create an incentive structure um, that, you know, that requires universities, if they're going to get federal grants in these areas of research, to get a seal of approval, essentially, indicating that they have gone through a systematic process to ensure that they've done due diligence and thought through the various questions involved. We have some concrete ideas about that, and I'm gonna hand back to Jeff to get into that. Yeah, thank you, uh, Glenn and Larry. That's a great question. And we are working, Glenn and I and, and some other uh, colleagues are, are working to actually put the meat on the bones, as you, as you put it, um, to really flesh out what exactly would this look like and how would this would work. Um, and, but basically, recognizing the deficiencies that both academia um, in, in both resources, capabilities, knowledge, and, and, and ditto for the government. And, and just on the government side, based on my experience, let me, let me add a few uh, uh, challenges that it has. First, um, when, when federal agencies fund scientific research, their responsibility first and foremost is to evaluate the merit of the scientific research and to ensure that their, um, their tax, the taxpayer money is spent wisely for that particular research. They are neither equipped nor 
um, um, required to conduct rigorous national security or ethical assessments when they're allocating grants, research grants. This is just simply not in their mission space. And to complicate matters worse is different agencies have different, obviously different priorities and missions, some of which may actually compete with each other in terms of who should be collaborating with whom, et cetera, um, basic science versus applied science, et cetera. And that represents challenges for the government. A quick example is, um, you know, uh, we, we have examples I've done in the past where NIH funded research on very beneficial medical areas have been diverted towards uh, PLA programs, right? And, and NIH is not in a position, nor is its mission to evaluate some potential national security risk when the research conducted in the US was, was sound, it was just being taken or applied or diverted to a place that is for the problem, for example, for the Department of Defense. Um, but the Department of Defense does not have oversight or control over what NIH funds. And so this kind of gets into why there needs to be some independent disinterested entity um, that is not subject to the parochial missions or interests of individual agencies and ditto for academia. Um, and, and, and by combining these resources, um, and we are going to propose some projects um, in the future, and I hope to work with other think, uh, uh, NGOs um, like Sophie Shop and others where we can kind of collectively tackle this. Um, and it could be almost like a public good or a service for both government agencies and academia so that the burden doesn't fall squarely on themselves. So, um... Let me ask uh, two more questions that may seem naive. Um, one would think that, uh, or it could be argued, and it is often argued, that if um, it's open research and it's going to be published, uh, shouldn't uh, we not be worried because it's going to be accessible uh, anyway? But isn't it the case that there's a kind of more nuanced character to research collaboration in terms of the way you think about a problem and some of the unexplored avenues that didn't wind up in a published article, but there's a, a broader stimulation uh, <clears throat> of potential avenues of research and other findings or possibilities that um, don't get um, necessarily conveyed in a publication, but uh, which could be derived through a relationship of research uh, collaboration. So shouldn't we be worried about that? That's the first thing. And the second naive question is, um, if we have an entities list at the Commerce Department that forbids, uh, that imposes export controls and the transfer of technology, um, why shouldn't universities uh, have to comply with that? Why shouldn't universities in the United States be forbidden from uh, doing collaborative research with entities anywhere? We don't want to only talk about China here, Iran, Russia, and so on, um, whose work represents uh, a threat to human freedom and US national security with the with the default position being a ban and exemptions being granted on a case by case basis. So I'll take the uh, the first question and then um, maybe Jeff can step in for the second one. Uh, I think you're absolutely right that the published outputs that we looked at um, in, our, in the corpora that we analyzed were really the tip of, of a research iceberg, right? Um, because, you know, published collaborations, open science, um, it, it, it only captures, you know, uh, the results and the methods that, that, that the scientists behind that, that particular bit of research found worthy of publication to answer the question they set out to do. But behind that is, you know, much larger. There, there are questions about data governance, for example, um, you know, Sophie alluded to the fact that we have a number of articles now that are increasingly being retracted that involved data sets that were apparently inquired without, acquired without the informed consent of the people contributing their biometrics or genetic data, right? You know, so 
getting access to data is sometimes a part of this too. And that doesn't necessarily show up in the published output. When you have collaborations with parties like CASIA too, you're building networks um, that are much bigger than just the authors that are named on the paper. And those networks of collaborations have independent lives of their own too, which can be potentially of concern. So you're absolutely right that, that there's a much larger, larger ecosystem that we need to be thinking about here. Um, and to be consistently systematically asking the questions that we try to highlight. Jeff, over to you on the second question. Yeah, and, and uh, I'll be quick. Just one quick follow up on that first question about open science. Um, China, as, and we don't have time to get into it, but you know, China has hundreds of these talent permit programs where they're, they're recruiting experts that were trained overseas to come back. If, if, if everything could be gleaned from just, you know, all the knowledge can be gleaned just from the published literature, why would they have spent a crazy amount of money over several decades and hundreds of programs to recruit individuals that had that gained that knowledge and experience firsthand by, you know, that's not in the published record? They would have they wouldn't have had those. They would have just stayed home and read the, the published literature and tried to replicate it. So there's all this other stuff happening um, with regards to um, the export control. I, I actually agree with your position. Unfortunately, currently, the National Security De Decision Directive 189 that was issued during the Cold War um, basically, uh, from a regulatory standpoint, restricts all uh, allows uh, there are no export control requirements on any basic fundamental research period. And so it doesn't matter whether an entity is on an entity list restricted on an export control regime, it doesn't apply. And, and I would argue, in my opinion, that it's time to revisit that. Federal agencies have continued to stop, uh, tout that as being, no, this is, this is our policy. But that was, that was an, a bygone era where there were four Soviet scientists in our entire R&D ecosystem. Um, that's not the place we're in now. And I agree that I think if, if there are entities that are on the entity list for human rights or defense related research, there should be additional layers of restrictions or controls put in place. So we would have to come up with some policy or regulatory fix um, to or update NSTD 189. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll let our audience know we're going to run about 10 minutes over. Um, so we've got about nine more minutes. And um, I, I've already posed in my own words some of the questions that have been raised. I'm going to pose three more and let you two decide uh, which ones to answer. Um, two are from Peter uh, Michelson, our colleague here, who has to wrestle with these issues at Stanford. Um, uh, the first is this, how open uh, would the assessments of this new civil society uh, coalition uh, be, uh, i.e., would they be published in an open website so that researchers at any U.S. institution could access the information as part of evaluating a potential collaboration? And then uh, Glennie specifically uh, says that um, uh, to you, uh, you know, uh, we need to kind of disaggregate things here. That, that is the nature of the research could matter and should be part of the evaluation. AI might trigger one level of concern about collaboration. Whereas when you really get deep, deep, deep into basic, 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 like looking for dark matter in the universe, maybe the ethical concern is uh, not there at all or, or not so acute. Uh, and then John Pomfret um, asks, uh, I think you, you both have an answer to this. Are there universities in the US that you know, provide a model for how to approach this in protecting their universities against collaboration with questionable institutions or uh, researchers? Are there any models we should look to? So why don't we start with you, Glenn? Right. So with regard to, to Peter's questions, I think they're excellent questions. Uh, and the answers could be actually devised in working with, with the universities in question to see what models best suits them. Uh, something that we discovered and that I think Jeff mentioned is that in the course of our research, um, 
uh, Viztech, one of the firms that we looked at, which is most deeply implicated with the Chinese police state, um, basically closed off its website to US points of presence. I think because they sensed that we might have been poking around in what they were doing. And so the more open you are about this kind of work, the more you tip off the, 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 you know, the, the, the partners of concern on the other side, uh, and that information goes blank. Uh, so I think there is a strong argument for providing this as a service uh, to the academic sector and, and to the research enterprise in a more quiet way, um, and not necessarily publishing all of the data that we're able to collect. Because the more open we are about that, the, the more that data will be turned off. Uh, China's doing a very good job uh, of scrubbing the internet, of, of incriminating information. Uh, things that, that you find today may not be there tomorrow. Uh, and so we don't want to make that job easier uh, by, by tipping our, our, our hat and, and saying what we know. Um, the second point is I absolutely agree that not all research is the same. This particular institute um, uh, and, the, and the applications that we looked at were, were in AI fields related to facial gait and iris recognition that have really clear applications to mass surveillance. Um, those raise extreme red flags. Research into dark matter, as Peter suggested, is not quite the same. And so absolutely, we need to take a nuanced view of this. Let, let me add, too, that part of our vision for some independent entity would actually create, working with academia um, and think tanks, is to create uh, a, a, a very nuanced risk assessment sort of model where you have a spectrum of risk, right? And And, and what you're really trying to do is just allow for stakeholders to make more informed judgments on their own and not, not force a particular judgment. And so that's an example of the criticality in the type of research conducted, um, where it is on the spectrum of basic, you know, basic, basic versus, you know, a potential or applied would go into as, as qualitative factors into a risk assessment model that would be provided um, Prop, as Glenn mentioned, probably more on, you know, a uh, less public version of, of, of that, and that would be provided as kind of a service. At the same time, um, I think you can kind of do a mix of everything where you can publish openly uh, reports and studies like this one. You could create, for example, um, um, uh, sort of our own entity lists, not related to, to commerce, but, you know, a, a list that catalogs organs, uh, divisions, uh, uh, commercial enterprises that are involved in the public security efforts and make that public and make it so that the world knows who they're dealing with. Um, and yeah, we run the risk that that may go dark, but at least there would be a list um, so that universities and, and, and companies can decide and say, you know what, th this is a no-fly zone, whether or not the government has any particular restrictions we do from a reputational and an ethical standpoint. And so you could do kind of a hybrid uh, of both public, publicly released information and data and then, and then more nuanced okay. sort of things for, for academia. Our position That's here really, Larry, is that, I mean, our goal is to empower people to make better decisions that are more consistent mm -hmm. with our values, really. And, and that's the, the best way to achieve that. Working with them is, is what we're willing to do. Good. Uh, thank you uh, both. I, <clears throat> I should have in indicated that Peter Michelson is our uh, associate dean uh, of H&S for the natural sciences. Now, um, uh, I'd like to close uh, with a question from another associate, former uh, associate dean of research at Stanford, uh, uh, Edward uh, Mocharski. Uh, and um, he asked the following question. He says, well, IRBs and institutions like Stanford basically well at, work well at what they do, examining ethical and financial issues. Um, but your scenario doesn't raise an IRB issue at all, he feels. Rather, it's a national security issue. No IRB reviews research that does not in directly involve human uh, subjects. So the suggestion you had, number three in your slide, uh, he thinks is kind of a disconnect and an example of the uh, limitations of academic research introducing uh, a public-private, you know, institution, independent organization, that that would be akin to the commercial IRB called 
Western Institutional Review Board, if you're familiar with uh, headquarters in Washington State, which many institutions that are too small to warrant the expense of their own IRB uh, make use of. So he wonders if um, you see any kind of model of that uh, and <clears throat> you know, what are the ethics of assembling a security review of surveillance? So I think he's absolutely right, actually. It is the fact that traditional IRBs do not cover this space. That's one of the many cracks through which this, this kind of activity is leaking, right? Um, the fact that, that this stuff on artificial intelligence, facial gate iris recognition does not involve the traditional triggers of, of human subjects research that automatically send you to an IRB. That's why this research can go forward without the kind of scrutiny that we're calling for. But because the IRB process already exists at a lot of universities and struggles with ethical questions, it is a mechanism that, that is already in place. And rather than create something de novo that would be more burdensome and expensive, we suggest perhaps expanding it to include the kinds of technologies and questions that we're talking about in this report to make use of something that already exists and repurposing it somewhat or expanding the scope of it. Uh, there are institutions that do not have good IRBs. And in fact, I think the, the, the entity, the coalition that we're talking about standing up in the middle could fulfill very much the same role of that Western Institutional Review Board because it would have the access to the information about you know, uh, uh, suspect partners in, in authoritarian nations it would understand the technology and it would be able to provide, you know, nuanced information to, uh, to a client that says, you know, this type of research with this particular partner raises the particular questions that you need to think about very carefully. And here's the risk profile so you can make an informed decision. Right. Uh, any uh, final closing word from either of you, Jeff or Sophie? Um, this is an ongoing uh, stream of research for us here in our project at Ed Hoover and uh, with our partners. Um, I think uh, the panel here is indicative of where we want to go with a coalition uh, and we'll continue working this space. So I want to thank Jeff very much for partnering with me uh, on this uh, report and Sophie for joining us. Yeah, I just echo uh, Glenn's remarks. I, I appreciate your partnership and hope to continue to um, to, to work in these areas in the, in the future. Thank you. For those of you in government and academia in the audience too, uh, we remain very open to your feedback and to working with all of you to just uh, do better in this space. Great, Sophie. Just to say thanks for including us in this discussion and we are happy to talk to whoever would like to talk uh, and to, you know, help with this effort because I think getting this right has enormous consequences for individual human beings, for the pursuit of knowledge, for compliance with law and the protection of human rights. So looking forward to, to being in touch about this. Great. Thank you all three of you for this really great and uh, immensely difficult and important conversation. Thank you to our very large audience, most of which stuck with us through our 12 minute overrun. Uh, thank you to Janet Smith and the staff of the Hoover Institution for their great support work. And we wish you all uh, a safe and happy holiday season. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.